Well, good morning, everybody. OK, let's try again. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> uh, great to have you here with us in the house of the Lord this morning, always. And thank you for those who are joining online as well. Uh, we pray that the Lord will bless in our time together uh, this morning as we honor him and bring glory to his name. A couple of announcements I just want to bring our way this morning. You probably noticed the table out in the front foyer. Uh, from our, our church envelope recorder. So your offering envelopes are, are available to be picked up this morning if you've signed up for them. Um, if you want to know more about what that is all about, please speak to Pam. She's out there and she'll be at the table. Um, but yeah, pick up your offering envelopes today uh, so that we can continue in 2024 to bless the Lord in that ministry. Also, immediately following the service today is a, a teller training meeting. So those of you who signed up to be tellers or those of you who are thinking about it and want to just know what it involves more, please uh, be part of that meeting. It'll be down in the choir room, which is down the hallway to the left, um, following the service today. And next week is Anniversary Sunday. Who can tell me how old our church is? Wow, silence. Okay, so I guess you're going to have to show up next week to find out. Um, we're having an anniversary service, of course. We have a guest speaker from uh, Fellowship of Evangelical Baptist Churches uh, from our uh, Tim Strickland is going to come as a, a church leader uh, from there to, uh, to preach, and we're going to be hearing afterwards from Bob Fleming, who is also tied into the church health uh, at Feb. He's going to be giving us the feedback from our church health survey that we did back a couple of months ago. Uh, so we look forward to that. There's going to be a luncheon. There's going to be cake. There's going to be, I mean, people. So it's all good. So we want to encourage you to join us next Sunday following the service. There's a lot of other announcements in your bulletin. I just uh, want you to draw your attention to those and just have, be aware of all the ministries that are happening and continue to pray for all the ministries. Uh, we have Bible study ministries. We have uh, children's ministries. We have all sorts of stuff going on. Please keep praying for all these ministries that the Lord will just bless and uh, the Lord will, will use people to reach out uh, on his name. So let me just offer a word of prayer as we begin our time and then our worship team will come forward. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for you are so good. And it is uh, with joy this morning, Lord, that we sing of your goodness. It is with joy, God, that we gather in your name this morning because you are God. And we are so honored to be considered your children. Now, Father, thank you. Thank you so much, God, for all that you are and all that you do. And all that you do that we are never aware of, all that you do that we never see. God, may somehow we honor you um, with these weak vessels you've given us, Lord, may we somehow honor you and give you glory this morning in our time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Worship team. Well, good morning, everyone. So I don't know how you go from, you're sitting there and thoughts are spinning through your head. You're thinking about things from the week. You're thinking about someone you just got done greeting. How do you get from there to uh, a state of worship? So I'd, I'd like you to take a minute right now and think about something that was on your prayer list that has been taken care of. And so... How about I give you maybe 20 seconds of silence. Just think about something that was on your prayer list, something that the Lord has done for you. And then with grateful hearts, we'll, we'll enter our time of worship. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand. Sin and darkness 
whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you laid down your life, that I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you laid down your life that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross You laid down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me All that you've done for me ask you to remain standing if you can. A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us and all who We'll sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all and the angels cry holy all creation cries holy you are lifted high holy holy forever 
And if you've been forgiven And if you've been redeemed Sing the song forever to the Lamb And if you walk in freedom And if you bear His name Sing the song forever to the Lamb We'll sing this song forever and amen And the angels cry Holy, all creation cries Holy, you are lifted greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all Jesus your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all and the angels cry holy all creation cries holy you are there your name is wonderful and there's power in that name Lord 
Lord, we thank you for this morning, for bringing us here into your house. I pray that your spirit would be able to speak to our hearts and minister to us as we listen to your word spoken through Pastor Dave. And Lord, as we uh, hear prayer, and Lord, as we continue to worship you. We pray these things in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Receive our tithes and our offerings, our gifts that we present unto the Lord as our act of worship to how wonderful and provisional he is for us. Let's collect our offerings. Father God, we thank you, Lord, so much for all you do and who you are and how you reveal yourself to us. And Lord, we ask that these gifts that we are giving back to you, Lord, that we know come from your hand uh, as blessings from our Heavenly Father. We pray, God, that you will use these gifts, uh, Lord, to to bring glory to your name. Uh, Lord, through our church, uh, through the mission agencies that we support, Lord, Uh, Through the many efforts that we try to help others, God, we pray that people will be drawn closer to you. Use these gifts, Lord, to accomplish your kingdom's purpose here on earth, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. A couple of uh, prayers to our our prayer update that is in your bulletin. I encourage you to continue to be uh, thinking and praying through the week of our people and all the different uh, movements. Uh, speaking of movements, uh, there was an addition to, the, uh, to Nicole's family this past week. Uh, I know we were praying last Sunday as Nicole was uh, in labor during our service. Well, she delivered later on that night and uh, delivered a beautiful, not so little, uh, girl named Elizabeth Jane. And uh, at, uh, I think, 8 pounds, 12 ounces. So not so little. But everybody is well, and so we just are, are thankful. And for the millages, we just want to continue to lift them up, and Nicole and James, and uh, just thankful for this new life that has come into the world. Also, um, for uh, Reese, we want to pray for Betty's uh, father, got, uh, who's back in hospital uh, with uh, COVID and pneumonia related to it. So we just want to pray for Reese for strength for this man. We also need to make a correction. We had been praying uh, for. Kate's grandma, the, that uh, her surgery was happening on the 17th, is actually happening this week coming up. So we want to lift up Kate's grandma as well this week. And uh, it was so nice to see uh, Gwen here this morning to be able to uh, praise and worship with us again after her surgery. So we're just thankful for how God is doing what God does. Uh, let me just read out of, our, uh, out of the God's Word this morning in Psalm 40. In relation to prayer, the, the Psalm of David goes... I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me, and he heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. This is what God does as we reach out to him. He establishes us in his presence. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you. God, that we can cry out to you at all times. God, I am thankful, Lord, for the fact that not only can we cry out to you, Lord, but you are attentive to our prayers. You listen. 
And we pray, Heavenly Father, that as you listen, Lord, your will would be done in our lives and through us and through our prayers. God, we ask that you will create in us patience. Because, God, when we pray, we want the answers to come before we even say the words. So, Lord, teach us to be patient and to wait upon you. Because we know that as a, our Heavenly Father, God, but also as a good and loving Father, Lord, that you will provide what is best. And you will give what is best, even if the circumstances aren't great, Lord, according to what our standard is, Lord, you will provide what is best. And so we pray, Heavenly Father, this morning that your will would be done and that we would learn your will through our prayer life with you. As we see your answers, God, that our hearts would get a better understanding, our minds would get a clearer definition of who you are. Lord, that we'll understand better your purpose and your mission for us here on earth. And God, that we will just be able to give thanks and praise to you because you give us this firmness, this stability. You lift us up, God, out of our despair and you set us on that rock with a, a solid foundation that we can have full confidence in that you are with us. Lord, thank you. God, I pray this morning that you will help us to come to you so quickly, Lord, in our sinfulness, in our brokenness, in our need. God, that we will come to you quickly and ask for forgiveness, ask for your provision. But Lord, that we also will come to you in our joy and our celebration. God, to recognize your hand is upon all things in life. We think about that this week, Lord, as we think about the birth of little Elizabeth to Nicole and James. God, just thank you so much for the safe arrival of this child, the first to their family. Lord, we thank you that they will raise Elizabeth up in a family that knows you and will give testimony to your presence in their lives. And God, as they transition from Nicole's working to uh, working at home with her uh, lovely daughter, Lord, and just caring for her, we pray, Heavenly Father, that you will help them in all their needs. And Lord, just thank you that they can have the blessing of this new life enter into their family. God, we do want to thank and praise you for how uh, we see your hand at work. We think about Gwen, who's here this morning, Lord, others who are here who have been battling with different things. God, just thank you so much for the strength that you give. And we pray, God, for that strength for Reese this week as he is in hospital now, Lord, with um, more another, another round of, of pneumonia and, and battling COVID. God, we just pray for him, that you'll strengthen him and his breathing, Lord, especially, and that you'll give him the strength to get through this and to join us again where he can worship and praise you here. God, for Kate's grandma, we pray this week for the surgery to go well. And Lord, we just think of... Uh, of even other needs that are happening in our family, Lord, and our church family. Uh, God, from injuries, from falls, we have a couple, Lord, listed here. Just uh, lift up uh, Linda's niece's husband, Aaron, who was injured in a, a very serious fall, God. We pray your hand upon him, even for Alistair's friend, Cindy, Lord. Just give her strength and give her comfort. God, for Gloria, with uh, a bout of shingles that she is battling with, God, strengthen her. And we think, Lord, of now, after Paul's passing, just thinking of Carol and her family, Lord, may you just be uh, a very real presence and a love for them that they just sense your, your guidance and your care for them. Lord, for all of our needs, we pray and lift you up. There's so many, God. If we can just pause in a moment, Lord, and usher up to you our own personal prayers, the needs that we are aware of in our own God, just quietly before your name. Let us pray. I thank and praise you, God, for the many mission partners that we have and the partnerships we have in the gospel. I thank you for our Connection, Lord, with uh, the fellowship churches, God, and just thank you for this new relationship that is growing and developing. I thank you, Heavenly Father, that we are celebrating next week our anniversary in which we give praise and glory to your name for keeping harmony alive for this many years. And God, we pray for your direction and your guidance for us in the future. 
Help us, Lord, to be instrumental in this community, this growing community across the street. Help us, God, to, to think of ways that are creative and, uh, Lord, that, that reach out to the needs of people around us. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you will give us that desire. Lord, and you will give us that energy. Uh, no matter how old or whatever obstacles we face, God, that you will give us the desire and the energy to reach in our community in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. God, may we truly be a light in this community for you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So it has been a busy week this week, and it's not over yet. Um, we have had a number of uh, shoeboxes roll in this week, uh, and we've had a lot of volunteers. I got to say, it's a little bit embarrassing when you have a whole bunch of volunteers come for a night and you get a total of seven shoeboxes, okay? That's embarrassing. Beyond our control, we don't know when people are bringing them in, except that we do know this afternoon there's at least two, maybe three churches that are bringing in a significant number of boxes. If you're not doing anything between one and six this afternoon, aside from watching football, we could put the game on here, you can watch it here. Um, and, and you can come and just be ready because we do know we have some churches that are bringing, uh, I think one is bringing 1,400 boxes today. Um, and so we have 176 of these shipping crates down in the gym right now. You're welcome to go down and, and have a look after the service today. Uh, representing some, how many, Andrew? Four, Kate? 4,000 4, and change. 4,400 or something like that, a shoe boxes down there. Um, so thank the Lord uh, for this, and thank you for your willingness to support this. There are churches that don't uh, even allow this to happen in them, in their, in their church, and so that's a sad thing. We are thankful that uh, Harmony Road has opened up the possibility for us to do this. We're going to watch a video. Guys, can you cue it up, please, for us? Watch a video this morning just of the whole kind of process from beginning to end, and then I'm going to invite Kate and Andrew to come on up and, and say a prayer over the, the boxes. When that shoebox is open, they're overjoyed. You can see them shouting, jumping. Oh, look at how much they are excited. This is the first time those children are receiving the shoeboxes. They are so happy. You can hear the laughter. You can hear the cheer. That excitement, it goes and goes and goes. Right now, we're in Ukraine, and today we've given out the 200 millionth shoebox to a little girl here, so it's a lot of fun. It's a privilege for us to be able to come and to help the people as much as we can. Every box is important, because every box is an opportunity to tell a child about God's love, about His Son, Jesus Christ. There's so much joy that one gift box can give. They really experience the love of Jesus. Operation Christmas Show, we celebrate something as simple as the shoe box because God uses it to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We got a full box on this team. This is such an amazing time. We're so happy to be here. This shoe box gift will impact a child's life all year round. We never dreamed we'd have an army of men and women who would come to make this program happen. This is what it's all about, telling others about Jesus. These shoe boxes go into 120 different countries where pastors and missionaries are going to use them to bring the gospel to kids. So you may think it's just a simple gift at Christmas time, but it's the gift of the gospel, the story of Jesus Christ. When that shoe box leaves that distribution center and it goes around the world, that's not just one person. That's the body of Christ joined together, delivering the good news of the gospel. They go by plane, they go by ship, they go by riverboat, they go by camels, they go by motorbikes. And these boxes go to some of the most remote areas of the world. And every box counts. After receiving shoe boxes, children are invited to participate in the Greatest Journey Discipleship Program. These children have just completed 12 lessons in the Greatest Journey. I believe that discipleship is the key and they are now followers of Christ. They will tell their friends about Jesus. My name is Gladys and I am nine years old. My friend Kemi told me I needed to go with her to church. I wanted to teach her about the Word of God. And when she came to my church, she received a gift box. For 
a long time, I asked my mom for a blanket. When I opened my shoebox, I found a blanket in it. When I came home, I showed it to my mom, and she said it was great. I told her about Jesus. Now me, my mom, my grandma, and Kemi go to church together. I am certain of one thing. God is my savior. Every box counts. Every box touches a child. It's like a snowflake. There's not one shoebox that is the same. And we are reaching millions of children with the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you get the heart of the child, you will reach the heart of the parents, you will reach the heart of the family, and then you will touch the community. We are seeing churches being planted, and more and more churches are being built. We will do whatever it takes to reach the ends of the earth with the gospel. That gift box is the beginning into their hearts. Isn't it incredible how these gifts touch the lives of these children? The joy, the smiles, it changes lives. Every year we see tens of thousands of children discipled. And we couldn't do this without you, so thank you for packing the boxes. Thank you for praying for these children around the world. God bless you, and keep packing those boxes. So this is absolutely a wonderful ministry um, because it's not just uh, providing uh, dollar store items to kids around the world who have never seen a dollar store. Uh, it is about providing an opportunity. Christian spoke a lot about the word opportunity last week, and it's about an opportunity to be able to present the gospel and for kids to be able to learn about Jesus uh, through a small gift that millions of people. I think, I think, the, I think the number's astounding. It's like over, a million, uh, over 11 million shoeboxes went out last year to kids around the world. So I want to invite Kate and Andrew to come on up uh, just for a moment with us this morning. I can't say enough about this couple and their love for this ministry, and God brought them to our church at the time where this ministry was growing, so it's wonderful because they're making it a lot easier for me. Uh, and, and, but they really have such a passion for this. Uh, they have such a passion for uh, seeing kids uh, knowing Jesus Christ. And uh, so if you could, yeah. Okay. So Heavenly Father, we pray over the boxes, all 4,000 of those shoe boxes and the more that are coming this later this afternoon. Each box... Um, represents a gospel opportunity. It might not just impact the child, but their entire family. And we want to make sure that they get safe to those children's arms so they can know how much Jesus loves them. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And let me just add another prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all the people that make this happen, Lord, the people who get the boxes and come and pack them and bring them back to us. But Lord, the people who organize it, like Andrew and Kate and the countless hours they put in, uh, Lord, just thank you for the hearts of servants who just love to see you lifted up high. Uh, God, bless this couple as they continue to serve you faithfully, Lord, and thank you for bringing them to us at a time when we needed uh, their help. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, just a little update on the, what's happening. Uh, we're, yeah, we're having a, a couple thousand more dropped off uh, today, and... Uh, <laughs> and, and then on Wednesday, at uh, uh, sometime around 6 o'clock, 6 o'clock, we're expecting the transport truck from Operation Christmas Child to be here, the big one with the big, uh, on the side of it, the big uh, logo and all that stuff, promotional stuff. And so if you're not doing anything Wednesday night at 6 o'clock, I sound like I'm a repeated record in all this, but if you're not doing anything on Sunday night at 6 o'clock, uh, we're probably going to be packing about... Uh, maybe about 300 of these uh, cartons or more onto a transport truck, so we could always use your help. Uh, but please be praying. Continue to pray. Continue to pray. I'm going to invite you to turn uh, this morning to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. It's uh, right following the temptation of Jesus Christ in the desert by, uh, by the devil. And it's... Uh, pretty significant that it follows in that place, because right after Jesus is tempted by the devil, the devil's attempt to try and thwart Jesus' plan and purpose, all of a sudden we have this statement of Jesus, which is an amazing statement. I'm going to invite you to turn to verse, I'm going to read from actually verse 14, Luke chapter 4, verse 14 to the end of the chapter, or 
to chapter, uh, verse 30, sorry. Luke 4, 14 to 30. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Holy Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the whole community. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. And he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and unrolling it, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they said? And Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Do hear in your hometown what you have heard that you did in Capernaum. But I tell you the truth, he said, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha, the prophet, yet none of them were cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All of the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up and they drove him out of the town, and they took him up to the brow of a hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff, but he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. A beautiful story from God's word for us this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word to us. Uh, It is beautiful, describing your son, Jesus, uh, describing what he was like, what he did, what he taught. And Lord, we are overwhelmed this morning to know Jesus. So Lord, help me as a communicator, help us as listeners, Lord, to to hear your word today and to be able to understand it and Lord, to to be challenged by it and to be uh, moved by it, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I need to start off with a bit of an embarrassing story this morning. As I was getting ready for church, I had set my shirt, which is a new birthday gift from Lisa that was two months ago, a new birthday gift from Lisa that I'm wearing. This morning, I was, it was on the ironing board, and I throw my tie in the ironing board, and I get ironing everything ready for, to get ready for church this morning, and the, my tie caught my eye. Because on my tie, when I threw it on the ironing board, there was this little kind of like a logo. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a little something there. And uh, and on my tie this morning, I looked and I thought, oh, that's an interesting tie. I've never seen that on any of my ties before. I've had this tie for a while, okay? So after I'm doing my ironing, I look closely at the tie. And actually, the picture on the tie is me officiating my niece's and her husband's wedding. They gave this to me as a gift. Alexandra's laughing. They gave this to me as a gift for marrying them. And they put a picture of me with the two of them while he is doing his words of promise to her, his vows. And I looked at it this morning. I was like, oh. And I I got very emotional. (laughs) The problem is they got married 15 months ago. (laughs) And I just clued in this morning that, so Emily and Chris, I'm sorry, but thank you for the beautiful gift. <laughs> and I was thinking about it this morning. I was very really moved by it. But I was also thinking about it in terms of, can I tie this in at all to what I'm saying this morning? And absolutely I can. Because what happens to me is I get busy. And when I get busy, things just kind of go flying by me and I don't take a moment to really look at them. And if I had looked at this time more carefully and not just seen it as a nice gift for somebody who's, you know, preaching uh, every week or once in a while, 
if I'd actually looked at it from the point of a gift and analyzed it a little bit more on the day I received it 15 months ago, I would have noticed the beautiful part of this gift, right? We had uh, a young man show up on our doorstep a couple of months ago. Uh, A lot of you were wonderful with him. Uh, His name was Step a couple of months ago. Uh, A lot of you were wonderful with him. Uh, His name was Justin. We don't know where he has gone over the last three weeks. We haven't seen him at all. Uh, But he he arrived at the front doorstep of our church. And I can't say how wonderful it was that uh, this church acknowledged his presence. We had some of you were giving him Tim cards like, like they were like money, like just throwing it at him constantly so that he could go and he could get food from Tim Hortons. None of you were angry with him and asked him, oh, get out of the way, I'm trying to get into church. I mean, he was sleeping right at the entranceway of our church. None of you spoke a bad word to him, at least that I was aware of. People brought food, lunches for this man and treated him as if he was basically part of our family, which was a wonderful witness to this man about what church can look like. And he just arrived on our front door. And I got to admit, I felt awfully um, convicted during that time because I was thinking, you know, you, you go in parts of Oshawa and you see homeless people or you see people who are in need, and, but you don't think of them arriving on your front door. And the Lord brought him to the front door of our church. And I believe he did that because he wants us to acknowledge, because maybe in our busyness, and maybe in our uh, rushing around, we forget that there are some pretty serious needs uh, right around us all the time. Even within our own church, there are some significant needs. And we can just get so focused on programs and bylaws and movements and all this other stuff that we forget about the people who are in need. This morning's message is about responding to people who are in need and, you know, spurred on, obviously, by Samaritan's Purse and the ministry of reaching out to the poor in the world. But I also love this passage because in this passage of Luke chapter 4, we see a beautiful um, statement of Jesus' mission. And I want to challenge us this morning that, uh, you know, when we read through the Gospels, we, we see Jesus' word. I want us to think about words that Jesus says that really challenge us really challenge us to understand him and what he is doing. Guys, the clicker, I'm not sure it's not working, so. But it's a statement of Jesus' purpose, his mission. And the beautiful thing about it is Jesus addresses people's physical and spiritual needs, okay? He quotes out of this passage in Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2, which is a messianic song. Back then in Isaiah, Isaiah was not speaking to something that was happening in his time. He was foreshadowing what was coming in Jesus Christ as the Messiah, like hundreds of years later. And and Isaiah is talking in this beautiful opening part. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the year of Jubilee, which is a year that happened every 50 years. It was seven Sabbaths worth of of years. Every 50 years, this thing called the year of Jubilee um, happened. And at the year of Jubilee, there was this complete forgiveness of all things. So people who were in prison, because of debts that they owed, were released from prison People who had to sell over their property uh, because they were in debt were given back their property. People who were slaves for for, uh, masters were actually given their freedom in the year of Jubilee. It was a beautiful statement about the forgiveness of all debts. So when Jesus opened the scroll, that, by the way, was given to him. He didn't choose it. And he knew in the scroll exactly where to go to find this messianic psalm by the hand of God who provided it. To the listener of Jesus' day, this was an incredible statement of hope. He was saying to all those who were listening to him, you have forgiveness of all of your debts. The debts of our sinfulness that we can't pay Even the the physical debts, Jesus was saying, you have this beautiful forgiveness. So the people were very intent 
on hearing. They were excited, I think partly because they were thinking, wow, all my debts are going to be gone. (laughs) But on the other hand, Jesus was speaking to a more deeper issue, and that is the debt of their sinfulness. And their forgiveness was going to be given through him. Today, Jesus says, Jews were waiting for, for centuries for this day. And Jesus was saying, today, it is happening. Just grasp that. We, we can't wait till we can open up our gifts on Christmas for a few hours. <laughs> and the people of Israel were waiting for centuries for this moment to happen. And they were just, oh, it's here in this man. And the beautiful thing about Jesus is he draws attention not to himself, but he recognizes that it's only through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit at work in him. In verse 14, it says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And then in verse 18, when he quotes it, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. Right out of the Spirit of the Lord is what moves us. And Jesus acknowledged that presence. That's just a little side lesson. Some people have looked at this passage in Isaiah chapter 61 and have done one of two things, kind of on the extremes. On one hand, they have uh, physicalized it, if that's a word. Um, And the physicalizing it is... Jesus is speaking about a social justice here. He, he's speaking about how we should be involved in working with the poor and the needy and bringing relief. And it's all about the physical. So people are in prison, right? People are poor. Uh, people are blind. People are oppressed. And we see that in our world today. Some people make it all about the physical, and the, that motivates them to serve in their community, which isn't a bad thing, but it's only part of the picture. On the other hand, some people look at this and spiritualize it and say, well, it's all about the spiritual world. It's not at all about physical needs. And they say, oh, the people who are, are the poor are the people who are the poor in spirit from Matthew chapter 5, or the people who are prisoners, or we are imprisoned by our sinfulness. And, and, there's, and there's truth to that too, but it's not just about the spiritual Jesus, in this beautiful statement, in his purpose, his mission, says that Jesus genuinely cares for both the physical and the spiritual. He cares for the whole person. He's not just looking for one aspect. He is caring for the whole person. So let's break this down a little bit. When we look at what it says here in this passage, Jesus says that that there will be good news that he brings to the poor. Good news to the poor. Uh, certainly the good news of being free of your debts is a great news. Anybody who has a mortgage these days would be, yes, I would love to have that debt gone. Anybody who sees that credit card come in that bill, I would love to have that wiped away clean. But Jesus is speaking then more than just that. If, uh, if we flip a couple of chapters to the right in Luke chapter 14, we see a beautiful encounter with Jesus. He's gathered at the Pharisee's house, at a Pharisee's house, who has invited him obviously over for dinner. And he's sitting at uh, this house uh, of a Pharisee, and, and they're all sitting around this table, and Jesus talks about, in that uh, passage, he talks about the place of honor. And so he says to them, many people want to sit in the place of honor. But he says, the moment that anybody sits in the place of honor, somebody else more honorable comes along, and they should be sitting in that place at the table. And, and then he does this even more powerful thing, is he says to the people who are gathered in that, that little intimate gathering, don't sit in the place of honor. Keep it open. And I think, I think personally he was foreshadowing that the only person who deserves to sit in the place of honor is Jesus himself. But he says, don't sit in that place, but rather do this. And in verses 13 and 14, he says... When you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. He said a little bit before this, he says, don't invite your rich friends and all these people to your table because then they will invite you to your house and then you'll kind of be paid back for this act of kindness. Here he says, go to the poor people, the needy people who cannot repay you, Because really, we shouldn't be looking for any kind of immediate payment for anything we do now. We should be looking for the only reward we get is in eternity itself. Jesus was looking at the physical and the spiritual. And he does that constantly through his ministry. To the poor people, he brings the good news. Think about it. 
The crowds that came to watch Jesus preach, 5,000 one time, 4,000 another time, those crowds were fed when Jesus recognized they were hungry. But he preached to them, recognizing they needed to hear about God. The woman at the well, she saw when Jesus crossed over all the cultural boundaries to come over and even just talk with her. And it, just, and it, and it goes into this beautiful thing. Can I draw water for you? Can I help you out? And it goes into this beautiful statement about how she needs to, to be focused on the living water that will never leave her hungry or thirsty again. Caring for people's needs Physical needs brings hope to them. It brings hope to people who are, who are poor, who are crippled, who are lame, who are blind. But we can't do so thinking that we are going to get any kind of reward for it. We don't do this because we are patting ourselves on the back. We're doing it because we want to recognize it will bring hope to children. And we saw in the video beautiful examples of children who have nothing, who are going to be brought into this place of hope because they have seen something bigger than their world around them. The shoebox ministry is a powerful ministry to helping out poor people around the world because it doesn't offer the financial resources to bring them out of poverty, but it gives them hope. And it's tied in with the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that they can learn what it means to be forgiven That there's a debt bigger and and, and a life that is more full and plentiful. Can you imagine what it will be like for children who in some of the videos have nothing? And I mean nothing. That one day they're going to be blessed with heaven. (laughs) Like going from nothing to all the glory of God in heaven. These children, we, we, I mean, I, I I would challenge, we probably cannot put ourselves there. I mean, I've been to the Dominican Republic, and I've seen poverty, too. I've seen kids who are enthralled for hours over a bike tire, okay? Not a whole bicycle, just the tire. And they take that bike tire, and they have a stick, and they can make that bike tire roll around the property, and they can do that for hours and hours and hours, and it's like, yeah, this is the best, a bike tire. (laughs) When was the last time we got excited over a bike tire? Can we really put ourselves in the position of kids or people who have nothing. It's really hard for us. I don't know if we can do it. But understand the glory for these poor who will get a taste of heaven one day and they will see all of the goodness, not the possessions, but all the goodness of God and just overwhelming. Jesus brings good news to the poor. He also brings freedom to prisoners. He brings freedom to prisoners. And uh, there was a regular routine. I know through the, the scriptures we can read the regular stories of, of how people, when they owed a debt, uh, they would get thrown into prison, right? And it's in the parable of the merciful servant. Oh, you know, you, he had him thrown into prison. We studied that at sports club not too long ago. People were regularly thrown into prison because of their debt. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus talks about him being the gate, and I just I thought about prison walls and all that stuff and Jesus and his freedom. He says in John chapter 10, verse 10, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief only comes to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come so that they may have life and life to the fullest. The thief is set to destroy. One of the methods of uh, Satan in this world is to destroy people's hope and aspirations. He loves to beat people down. He loves to um, have an assault on them personally. And he wants to take away any possibility that they think there is anything good in life. How opposite is Jesus to that who brings the fullness of life, the beauty of life? He he brings us the the opportunity we can go in and out (laughs) and to have this ongoing relationship with him in which we can just see life and life to the fullest. Today in our world, people are imprisoned in so many ways. We are imprisoned by debt, physical, legal debt. We are imprisoned by mental and physical health issues. We are even imprisoned by our own lifestyle. We live a certain way and and, and we're stuck in that and we can't kind of break out of that way. 
Sometimes we are imprisoned by trying to keep up the appearances of other people and trying to make it look like everything is good with us and that we're all okay. We're imprisoned by these things. And whether it's a prison ministry or some other kind of prison, Jesus brings hope to those who are imprisoned. He gives freedom to them. Again, pointing to the spiritual aspect, how our sin imprisons us. We are slaves to our sin. And Jesus says, you have freedom if you confess your sins to me. Jesus brings freedom to all who are stuck in prisons of different types. Jesus brings release. Sorry. Skipped one. Jesus brings healing to the sick. We see over and over again in the Gospels how Jesus was taking care of people who were in need physically. In uh, Matthew chapter 12, they brought, in verses 22 to 23, they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed that demon-possessed man who was blind and mute so that he could both see and talk. And all the people around were astonished at this healing. Why? Because they said, could this be the son of David? Could this be this simple man who is doing this? No, it's through the power of God that Jesus could do this. Jesus brought healing so that it would give testimony to who he was, that he was God's son who was sent into this world. And there's many more examples of Jesus bringing physical healing to people where it led to this beautiful opportunity for him to address their spiritual illness. It helped them to address their blindness. They couldn't see who God was. And and so uh, we have these beautiful examples of people who are blind being brought to Jesus, and then their eyes are opened, and they can see. People who are bleeding are brought to Jesus, and the bleeding is healed. People whose child or loved one has passed away, and Jesus can bring them back to life. In other words, what Jesus was doing is he was telling people that he is the power of life itself. And he brings healing so that people can bring testimony to what God can do. We see that regularly here. How God brings healing to people so that they can bring praise and glory to his name. God's hand upon us, a reminder to us that he brings healing to all of our sicknesses, both physically and spiritually. God can do all things. And to the oppressed that Jesus speaks about in this as well, he brings release. There is a lot of oppression in our world today. There is a lot of darkness in our world today. There is a, a remarkable number of people who are, who are um, ending their life because of spiritual depression or some kind of form of depression. There is a lot of darkness in our world today, whether it's through political oppression or taxation or persecution or mistreatment or whatever, People want to oppress in order to try and subdue others, to control others, to to retain their power. It was true back in Jesus' day, and it's true today. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 16, Jesus uh, recalls this story for people. And when evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word, and he healed the sick. This was what to, was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah, where he says, he took our infirmities and he bore our diseases. Jesus gives us this new way to live that takes away any darkness of our life, whether it's a spiritual darkness, whether it's an emotional or mental darkness, Jesus can take away any oppression that we feel, that we sense. He is powerful. And how powerful is it when somebody comes alongside of you in a time of need where you feel like you are being oppressed for whatever reason? How powerful is it when somebody comes alongside of you or me in that difficult time to minister to you? Well, Jesus did that, and he encourages us to do that. Jesus brings relief to people, both physical and spiritual. In verse 18, it is talked about the anointed one. He is the anointed one. And that the anointing was a very symbolic thing that was done in the Old Testament. Uh, items in the tabernacle were anointed with oil in order to consecrate them for the use of the Lord. And when Jesus is saying, I am the anointed one, he says, I am consecrated by God for use in his service. That he can bring the fulfillment and the hope of God. Jesus promises in this passage that he will bring hope 
through his word. Today, scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Today, scripture is being fulfilled. He is the pattern for you and I to follow. His mission and his heart for the poor and the needy is something that we need to emulate. We need to follow. We need to care for people's physical needs and spiritual needs, as Jesus did. We need to point people towards how Jesus can provide for whatever need they have. We need to adopt this. And I think sometimes we can get a little bit used to being around poverty in this world. We can get a little bit used to, desensitized to people around us who are in need without really thinking, how can we help them? One of the wonderful conversations I had this week with somebody who was down in the gym when we had all the shoeboxes all around us and and we just stood there for a moment, and the conversation went kind of like this. This is great. What, you know, this is a great thing that is happening here, just to absorb it for a minute. But then the conversation went, I wonder if there's more we could do here at Harmony to be like this in another way. Like, it's great that we are doing this, but is there another way that Harmony Road can be in really intentional? We have wonderful mission partners. And we have wonderful ministries that we support in this community and other communities to bring this kind of healing and hope to people. But is there something harmony could do? The question, and then it kept, you start dreaming, right? And dreaming is always a scary thing. Because you start going to places like, you know, I mean, I hear from a, a young woman in our congregation who works with uh, the needy of our, of our city. And uh, she says, you know, our, our shelters are full. They were full months ago. And we haven't even hit the cold weather yet. Like, you start thinking, could we ever provide, like, emergency shelter on a really cold night? I know there's a lot of, oh, you know, it's like, oh, we got to have a lot of work. To, yeah, we would have a lot of work to do. But is there something more we could be doing to help, either personally or as a church? Is there something more we could do? I'm not sure the answer to that. I kind of feel in my gut that there probably is more that we can do. I'm just not sure how. And maybe we need to be praying to that end. When Jesus gives this statement to the people, the people are uh, too, too kind of too focused. First of all, one group of people is amazed at his gracious words. Oh, there's going to be hope. There's going to be healing. These are wonderful words. I'm so encouraged. I'm so excited by this. Awesome. This is great. But then there's other people as Jesus goes on to talk more about in this passage, he talks about how the gospel is not just for the Israelites. It is for people who are beyond Israel. It is for the unbelieving nations around. And the people, when they heard that, oh, they weren't so happy. They were pretty angered because they thought that God was just for them, not for everybody. He highlights this in the section where he talks in verse uh, twenty. Uh, in, in verse 20, well, basically verses 24 and on, he talks about Elijah. Elijah, even though was surrounded by a bunch of widows in Israel, was not sent to heal or to help those widows, but was sent to the region of Sidon, was outside of Israel, outside of the Israelites. Elijah was sent to help the widows. And Elisha was sent not to Israel's lepers, but to the Syrian Naaman, to help in healing that leprosy. What Jesus, what God was doing back with Elijah and Elisha was foreshadowing what Jesus would do in the New Testament. This is not a gospel for just the Israelites. This is a gospel for all people. We need to make sure as a church that we don't think that the word of God and the preaching and the learning is just for us. This is really intended to be extended out into our communities through us. What we learn about God is supposed to be translated into the words of people around us who don't know and don't believe. We are a wonderful, welcoming community of faith. People walk through the door, they, they can't leave for an hour because we're all talking to them. That's a wonderful gift that God has given to us. And we need to ex expand that somehow beyond the walls of our church so that we can continue to be this warm and welcoming place so that people can feel like they are included, whether they are homeless, whether they are blessed with a home, whether they have finances or whether they don't. They need to be blessed here knowing that they are welcome, that God welcomes all people into his kingdom. And sometimes we might get a little bit nervous about how people will react. They might get angry with us if we 
start saying, oh, well, you know, we have a bunch of homeless people joining us this morning in service. That would change things a little bit, maybe. But wouldn't it be a wonderful extension of the, of the mission of God? One of my favorite passages in the Bible, I mean, it's hard to say a favorite passage in the Bible. One of my favorite passages in the Bible is Ephesians 3, 10, and 11. It says, his intent is that now, again, now, through the church, through us, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord. God's intent is that through us, through us, God's wisdom would be made known. The word manifold, when it says manifold wisdom, the word manifold is a really beautiful word. It means colorful. It is actually the root word that is used in the Old Testament to describe Joseph's coat of many colors. The manifold wisdom of God. It is used to describe flowers and embroidered things in Jesus' day that had all these different patterns and colors woven into this embroidery. That is the wisdom of God. And he uses that word intentionally to us to remind us that God's wisdom is so complex and so beautiful. And that he has created this body of believers, this family, he has created us to display that beauty and that majesty and that complexity of who God is to the world around us. We are a tapestry, so to speak, of of our God. Think about it. In this community, we have a variety of ethnicities. We have a variety of colors, of ages, of languages. In this community, we have a variety of careers, of family makeup. We have all this variety. There's no community like the church for this. No community in the world is like this. And God has assembled this so that we could be displaying his tapestry, his wisdom, that people can understand how beautiful and majestic our God is. So I encourage you, this focus on shoeboxes is a wonderful focus for a project, but it goes way beyond that. We are to be God's tapestry in this world. The color of our God, the beauty of our God, displayed for all to see. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, so much for your word. I thank you, Lord, how... Uh, Your word just comes to life as we start to plumb its depth. And God, we enjoy the challenge of your word. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning we would be challenged. Challenged, Lord, to, to see more of you and to see people loving more of you. Thank you, God, for the blessing that we can partner with the Samaritan's Purse and in collecting shoe boxes for our region that we will know these boxes, God, will go into the hands of children in just a few months, children in parts of Africa and the Ukraine, parts of uh, um, Latin America, God. We just know these boxes are going to go out and bless children in these poor communities. And they're going to be excited over the gifts inside the boxes, Lord, as they open up and they they see a toy or a a stuffy. They're just going to be so excited for something that they maybe have never seen before. But God, the greatest privilege of this is the opportunity that they will have to learn about how beautiful and majestic you are. That they can grow in this discipleship program to understand more about the God who loves them regardless of what they do and don't have. Regardless of where they come from. Regardless, God, of the challenge of living in poverty. God, we thank you that they will know, they will hear how much you love them. We pray, God, for a blessing, not only on our shoeboxes, as Kate did earlier, Lord, but on all the shoeboxes that are going to be reaching out in Jesus' name. God, may we see our world changed as people come to understand the beauty of who you are. Help us, God, to be instruments of that in our community. Help us, God, to reach out for the physical and spiritual needs in our community so that people can can see the beauty of how you reach out and provide all things for all people. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Worship team.
Testing, there we go. Thanks, Pastor Dave, for uh, sharing that challenge uh, from God's Word. You know, it's, it's really daunting sometimes when we think about how, how do we share with others? You know, how do we get started? Um, interesting in that passage, it started off with Jesus was filled with the Spirit. And being filled with the Spirit was how he was able to minister so effectively to the people around him. I'd like you to, to when you see it, uh, there's key words here in the song we're about to sing. Blaze, spirit blaze, set our hearts on fire. So if we focus on uh, allowing the spirit to work in our lives, he will help us to understand how we can tangibly share Jesus' light to others. Please stand. Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. God, that is our desire to bring you glory. I pray, Heavenly Father, you will give us opportunities this week, encounter people this week, 
uh, have circumstances come our way this week, Lord, where we will see your glory at work, that we might give you praise and glory for who you are. Lord, work through us, minister to us, and may your spirit in us be a witness for others to see you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.